In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, the truth about stem cells, what to do when you can't exercise, how endurance athletes can gain muscle, how to fuel with ketones, is heavy lifting bad for your heart, and much more. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, the studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place. Right here. Right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Brock, I am exhausted. <laughs> you know, I feel like there's been uh, 30% of these episodes that you've started by saying something along those lines, but why are you exhausted really? this time? It's because I have very full mornings. I wake up and I yeah. crush the day by the time we start recording this podcast, which we usually do like around 10 a.m. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that as a diss. It it definitely is just a, a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> yeah. You make it sound like I have adrenal fatigue. Yes, I'm just no, highly productive. That's not what I meant. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if it came across that way. <laughs> <laughs> the myth that is adrenal fatigue. Mm. No, I've been, I've been working on the turkey. It's Thanksgiving tomorrow. American and Thanksgiving. I am in charge yes. of the turkey. Yeah, American Thanksgiving. So this morning I I brined my turkey. Have you ever brined a turkey? Every year, yes. That is the only way. Oh. I give two thumbs oh up my to that. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So I did sage and rosemary and salt water and it's uh we're out of room in the refrigerator, so it's out on the deck in the Yeti cooler right now. And well you don't really have to worry morning, about cooling it, keeping it cool if it's completely submerged. It's kind of like pickles. Like I you don't can't have anything. I don't want to get food poisoning based on the advice of some Canadian. Yeah, so that's probably <laughs> that's probably a good call. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, and then tomorrow, what I'm going to do is uh, cut open all the skin on the outside and stuff it all with this grass-fed butter, and then I'm going to smoke it for about three hours on the Traeger grill mm. with uh, with a, like a cedar pellet. Mm. Now that is something I have not done. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be good. Wait, so where are you putting the butter? You, like inside the the like where you'd put the rest of the stuffing? Or are you putting it under the skin somehow? I'm gonna put it under the skin. Wow. Cut little openings in the skin. I'll put a little bit inside too. So damn, it son, be pretty good. Yeah, and if it backfires, uh, we can always have sweet potatoes and broccoli and whatever crap everybody else brings. But so. of course, with with the marshmallows on the sweet potatoes, isn't that a American staple? Exactly. And even though it's probably a little bit late for this, actually, after we record, I am going to put on my camouflage and go hunting for turkey just because that's a Thanksgiving tradition for me. So if we have two turkeys, one winds up in the freezer, one gets eaten. But either way, Greenfields are going to gobble. Happy Turkey Day. News flashes. So this is the part of the show the where we show. review all the news flashes. The news Welcome flash part to of the, show. the news. <laughs> uh, this this actually is where I get a chance to tell you guys about some of the things I'm I'm super excited about that I've been tweeting. If you go to twitter.com slash it's my Twitter handle, Ben Ben Greenfield. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can you can read the studies that I'm looking at every single day because you know my habit is I get up in the morning and I read a lot of this research. And I came across this interesting story about uh, this this doctor at a privately held company in Miami called Longeveron, kind of like Longevity. I, I love guess, that name. That is Longeveron. That's good stuff. Yeah. I like anyone who makes up words. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, what they do is they use stem cells. They use mesenchymal stem cells, these so-called MSCs. And up until this point, there's been a lot of back and forth about whether these things actually work. So technically, MSCs are supposed to be involved with regulating and reducing inflammation mm -hmm. and repairing uh, particularly blood vessels. But they've also got some some good research on them for knee injuries to ulcerative colitis. So they're like little miniature 
drug delivery factories in a way. That's why a lot of people get these stem cell injections to repair and regenerate their tissue. But there's this whole idea of anti-aging, right? Like people saying, oh, I want to get like an, an IV infusion of stem cells as an anti-aging protocol. And whereas a lot of those things I just mentioned do have some evidence behind them for working, mm-hmm. there has not yet been up till this point any clinical trials to see if stem cells can actually help to, you know, reverse aging, so to speak. So Longevron actually conducted a trial, and I'll link to it in the show notes. If you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 392, you can read about this, but they just published their first study on frailty, and they did an IV infusion of mesenchymal stem cells uh, to a large number of senior citizens and showed remarkable improvements in physical performance measures and inflammatory biomarkers. And the average age of these patients was about 76 years old. So when you see something like a reduction in frailty, a reduction in frailty is actually one of the reasons that people wind up getting injured or dying or being unable to take care of themselves as they age. So it turns out that, you know, this idea of perhaps once a year or, you know, some people even say once every five years, injecting yourself with the younger you or with some type of stem cell extract it seems to work not just for joints and for inflammation and for ulcerative colitis and for some of these other reasons that folks have used it more kind of like in a targeted manner to specific areas of tissue, but it also appears to actually truly have an anti-aging effect. So now we can we can say that it actually works. Did did they define exactly how, well, I guess how they defined frailty, frailty in the study? Because that's mm, sort of a, well, that's a the, weird sort yeah, of kind of thing yeah, to I mean, quantify. You, if you read the the abstract, for example, and I'll link to that as well in case people don't have time to read the the, the full article, uh, frailty is defined as decreased physical and immunological functioning. Basically, getting sick more and being unable to move around as much as you used to. Hmm. Okay. So, so that's kind okay. of kind of the idea. That's measurable. So, yeah, yeah. So, so that was cool for those of you who have banked your stem cells. Yeah, get them, <sighs> get them injected. And those of you who haven't, yeah. there are other things you can do, like exosomes and V cells. Mm-hmm. And I'm working one of the sections of my book, which is still about six months out from getting released, kind of dives into all the different forms of stem cells and how one could go about getting them and what to do if you can't afford or you don't have access to your own stem cells. I've just so, been making sure that I eat a lot it. of uh, baby carrots in particular, the the baby ones. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. kind of like getting yeah. blood from a from a, a teenager yeah it's like the the blood of young mice getting injected into old mice mm-hmm. and reversing aging i think if you eat baby carrots that it would also cause you to become more baby like yeah. i suppose absolutely yeah i like your logic <laughs> i like it i'm a genius uh, speak, speaking of frailty there was another uh, study that was pointed out to me. It's not a new study. It's an older one. But as part of my book research, I've also been looking into ways that we can track our our anti-aging efforts or our efforts to simply stay more healthy overall. You know, things like grip strength. Mm. That's one that's got some studies behind it. You know, how hard can you grip one of these dynamometers or, you know, like a captain's of crush hand grip strengthening device. And another is walking speed. Yeah, your actual walking speed, you know, say if you if you can maintain like a 4.0 walking speed on a treadmill for 15 minutes at a slight incline. That's a, you know, it's tough, but that's a that's a good measurement of your your kind of lack of frailty. But this this new one, I really like because this is something I do every day. I do 30 of these every day. And sometimes when I'm weight training, if I want to jack my heart rate up and kind of do a little bit of concurrent strength and endurance training, I will I will do this in between sets. And it's simply sitting down and standing up, sitting down and standing up. Mm-hmm. And what this means is you but sit on down floor. on the floor. Yeah, you sit down on the floor and you simply get up off the floor. And the thing is, there are, of course, a variety of ways you could do this. You could try to sit down and stand up, uh, technically without using your hands, yeah. is the way that it was described in this study. Or as few uh, limbs as possible. As few limbs as possible. You get one point subtracted from five for each support that you use. So if you use your knees to get up, that subtracts points. If you use your hands to get up, that subtracts points. And you can, in fact, get up. You know, If you want to be at the, have the very best score, you get up in basic, with basically like a pistol, or like your hands don't touch the floor you sit you sit down on the floor your hands don't touch the floor you kind of pull one leg underneath you and you stand up in almost like a single leg squat that's like the creme de la creme but i think that simply the ability to with both legs be able to 
sit down, stand up without using your hands. And it turns out this actually is a significant predictor of mortality. Sounds silly, but it actually is a significant predictor of mortality in 50 to 80 year old subjects. Isn't that crazy? Uh, it, it is crazy. I, I it, you really do have to sort of make some like open your mind and, and look outside the box. It's not that just doing that is going to cause you to live longer. It's just that people who are able to do that have the yeah. lifestyle that supports somebody yeah. who lives longer. And I think some people get a little bit hung up on that and they're like, okay, I'm going to yeah. get up off and down, up and down the floor. Like, right. And so that's that it. I can and I'm still going to smoke yeah. and drink and eat right, McDonald's right. and stuff, but I'm just going to, yeah. yeah, that's not yeah, how it's it works. It's a corollary <laughs> of your functional fitness. And ultimately, I try to do 30 a day, sit down and stand up 30 times. It's kind of like that, you know, occasionally I'll do 30 burpees instead, which is kind of like the opposite face down. Yeah. But that's kind of my goal is to be able to do 30 burpees or 30 times sit down and stand up in a row for my life. And when I travel with my boys, for example, the very first thing they do when they get up is they got to do 30 burpees or 30 sit down, stand up. So... It actually is a is a cool thing to instill in the younger generation. Sure. So, uh, another one, I've got two more I wanted to mention. One was uh, about the satiety index. This is another older study, but it was pointed out to me this week, and I thought it'd be interesting. Do you know what the most satiating food is, Brock, based on uh, actual laboratory studies of dozens and dozens of different food groups? Like, we know that the most nutrient-dense is, uh, well, you know what that is, right? Uh, I'm going to say, uh, oysters. Actually, uh, oysters are high. Shellfish are very high in the nutrient density scale. Liver is at the top uh, of okay. the nutrient density scale. Beats out kale and blueberries by <laughs> far. Yeah. However, uh, on the satiety scale, in terms of what actually keeps you full for the longest period of time, what do you think that was found to be? Not steel cut oats. <laughs> That's what I'm going to guess. Those things well, shoot through me. Oh, well, still cut oats are very high in fiber, which yeah. is one of the reasons that this particular food was found to be very high in its ability to be able to satiate. Since it's about eighty oh. percent water, it's got about four grams of fiber. Don't don't uh, yeah, answer yet if excited. you know what it yeah. is, because I want <laughs> I want the audience to keep guessing. Okay. Uh, and so, a lot of the starch, a lot of the fiber starch, uh, does not get converted into glucose and just kind of fills up your stomach and results in this slow drip of energy into your body. And also, this same food has a very uh, large, surprisingly large vitamin and mineral content like vitamin A and C and E and a relatively high amount of antioxidants as well. Uh, in particular, uh, one antioxidant that helps you protect you from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So what what's the food, Barack? Well, I just got whisked back to 2011 when you had your superhuman uh, live event and a fellow named Ray Cronice spoke at it and uh -huh. he was uh, trumpeting the glory of potatoes for exactly those the, reasons the potato the potato yes and not not we're not talking like a fancy sweet potato uh we're, we're, all we're talking dressed. like just a basic <laughs> plain old white potato has an incredible ability to be able to satiate the appetite and as a matter of fact as as has been shown by several people who have experimented with the so-called potato diet you can actually survive on potatoes for a pretty long period of time so, yeah there was a guy who famously did it for i think a full year he ate potatoes and his like blood yeah. work was amazing and he lost a ton yeah. of weight and put on he lost 21 pounds yeah. yeah he he was eating like 20 potatoes a day and he lost 21 pounds yeah. i remember that that was that was back in 2011 i think when they did that one i think that was one ray carnice was actually talking about so yeah i'm not saying you should just eat potatoes all the time but uh don't necessarily demonize the potato and if you want to fill yourself up pretty quickly especially if you're one of those people like me who likes to save all their carbohydrates for the end of the day you know and i do sweet potatoes and tubers and beets, parsnips, carrots, you know, fermented sourdough bread, quinoa, amaranth, millet, you name it. I'm not highly selective as long as it's like a recognizable food our ancestors would have eaten. Uh, potatoes would be another one to throw in there as something that can uh, leave you far more satiated after dinner and perhaps less likely to go out and buy some Halo Top ice cream. So <laughs> there you have it. There you have and it. <laughs> Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention, since we are so close to the Thanksgiving holidays, is uh, a new study that was published in the Journal of Positive Psychology that goes into the best tactic to avoid raising a materialistic child, uh, pointing out that materialism has been linked to a 
bunch of different health problems, including anxiety and depression and a relative lack of empathy. So what they did was they surveyed uh, almost 900 uh, adolescents. These were kids, uh, not really kids, some of them were teenagers. They were 11 to 17 years old. And they particularly surveyed them on the value that they place on money and material goods. But then they did a survey of gratitude, assessing how thankful these kids were for the people and for the possessions in their lives. And there was a direct negative association between materialism and gratitude to materialism and gratitude. And so I, I think that if anything, this should influence the parents out there and really anybody. It's, you know, in, in this sense, children really are just little adults uh, to adopt a gratitude practice. You know, I'm, I'm jaded because obviously I, I know someone's going to point this out. I actually write and produce a gratitude journal. I'm not just saying this so I can sell more copies of my gratitude journal. But there, there are a lot of things you can do, like simply ask at the end of the day, uh, around the dinner table, what people are grateful for. You keep a gratitude jar. This is one of the recommendations from the researchers where you can write something down that you're grateful for each week and you just fill the jar throughout the week. Uh, there, there's so many different ways to be grateful. You know, I'm, I'm, I am, of course, a huge fan of writing in a gratitude journal each morning one thing that you're grateful for. It doesn't have to be 15 or, or 20 things. One of my friends has a rule where before he turns on his phone, he has to write 20 things that he's grateful for in the morning. I think 20 sounds exhausting. Personally, but but one <laughs> That's thing too much too much do one thing. It's just too much. I can't oh, be thankful man. for that many things. But but I thought this was this was great. You know, it's perfect timing for this holiday season of Thanksgiving, and I think that it should be to a certain extent systematized. Just like anything in life, the more you systematize it, the more you do something like have a gratitude journal at your bedside or set up a gratitude you know big glass mason jar with some post it notes and a pen next to it somewhere in a central location of the house, or you know have a habit before every family meal, you know, you go around and each person says one thing that they're grateful for. A lot of ways to skin that cat, but I think it's important. You know what I do or what I've started to do just recently, I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't make it sound like I've been doing this for very long, but just recently I adopted this idea that, and I borrowed this from Jordan Harbinger, our friend, uh, Jordan, Jordan Harbinger yeah. show, um, that, you know, how when in your messages, like your text message app, you get like that sort of history of all the messages that you've sent. Yeah. Scroll to the very, very bottom. So the oldest message that you either sent or received, like that's been sitting there dormant for who knows how long. Think of something that you're grateful for from that person and then tell them that. So not only does it reignite sort of a friendship or a relationship that you had with somebody that may have gone dormant, but it also fulfills that that gratefulness. And it's a, it's a nice mm. sort of double double whammy I've been really enjoying for the last couple that's of weeks. That's great. That's so much better than texting photos of your genitals to people. Well, you could do both, I suppose. I know. As long know as it's consensual. Yes. Special announcements. Well, with Thanksgiving so close, and I know we're, we're kicking this Thanksgiving horse to death, but we might as well because with Thanksgiving comes Black Friday and... Our, our sponsors our sponsors have really stepped up to the plate. We have a lot of really cool deals going on. I'm going to spell out a few of them okay. for you guys. First of all, of course, uh, my company, Keon, has a bunch of bundles that we put together for Black Friday. And this includes the fact that anytime you order over 100 bucks, we give you a $25 gift card. Over 150 you get a $50 gift card. You order over 250 get a $100 gift card. I put together a bunch of bundles like the Life Bundle, where you get amino acids and coffee and our clean food bar and Keon Lean. Uh, we've got the Recovery Bundle, which is uh, fish oil with Keon Flex, kind of a shotgun for fighting inflammation, uh, more amino acids. We've got one that's like a, a coffee and a bar bundle. Mm. It's all over at getkeon.com and lasts until November 27th. So if anything, I would say like grab the coffee and the bars. Those go amazing together, like having a nice piping hot cup of coffee with one of our clean food bars. Ah, uh, it's Nirvana. Mm -hmm. So that's all. And you don't need any code get. for that either. You just you no, don't have to just automatic. Anything. Just go automatic when you go over there. Yeah, uh, our friends over at Clearlight Saunas. Our friends over at Clearlight Saunas have put together a really good deal as well. Now, this is the sauna. You know, I, I was just in it about an hour ago. I go in every single morning when I'm home, and of course. 
talking of longevity, there is, of course, that well-known Finnish study that found if you can get your ass in a sauna about four times a week, and they did Just find more is better. They found, yeah, they found more is better, <laughs> and they found that also uh, the amount of time that you spend in it is better. Uh, there's probably a law of diminishing returns somewhere in there, but they found that 20 to 30 minutes was very good and huge decrease in cardiovascular disease, all cause mortality. And I think Alzheimer's was like something shocking, like a 40% or more decrease in risk of Alzheimer's from this sauna practice that hmm. the Finns have. And what Clearlight has done is they've, they've created a sauna, but unlike most infrared saunas that microwave you with radiation while you're in them, they've reduced the EMF exposure to almost zero. And they also have three different infrared frequencies, near-infrared, mid-infrared, far-infrared, and a lifetime warranty on the sauna. So I go in there and foam roll and do yoga and meditate and swing the kettlebells. I have this one thing that I do, which is like a, a holotropic breathwork audio where I will uh, microdose with a small amount of psilocybin mushroom and lay on my back in the sauna after I've preheated it, and I do an hour of holotropic breath work, and it, it, it just redefines your entire week. I do that sometimes on Sunday mornings and go into the rest of the week just feeling like a new man. It's crazy. It's almost like a, a detox for your consciousness. I just made up that phrase. It's kind of woo-woo. But, <laughs> That's a uh, new anyways. Book. That's so be it's the book. sanctuary. Yeah, the sanctuary is the one that I have. Uh, and if you use code Ben, you get five hundred bucks off the sauna, and they give you a free gift as well. Uh, and uh, you can see what it looks like if you go to their Instagram, uh, which is at Clearlight Saunas. And if you go to HealWithHeat.com, their website, HealWithHeat.com, and you use code Ben, you'll get five hundred bucks off the sauna and a gift with your purchase. So, but the gift it. will not be psilocybin. Yes, I've been told exactly. Yeah. Yes, but almost as good as psilocybin is a good organic wine, and this is what we'll be drinking tomorrow at Thanksgiving dinner, uh, wine from my friends over at Fit Vine, over at Fit Vine. They have these really rich, bold, and, and powerful red wines, you know, in, in, uh, in their case, they actually ferment it uh, for a longer period of time to actually increase the alcohol. So this is not like one of those hangover free wines per se, that we've talked about before. This is one of those wines that's that's very low in sugar. I wouldn't necessarily endorse drinking a full bottle. But more importantly, it's organic. They've filtered out all the 70-plus different toxins that you'd normally get in wine. And they've expanded to uh, eight different types of wine that you can get. And they also have a limited edition holiday red blend uh, in addition to the Cabernet and their Pinot Noir, the mm. Prosecco, the Rosé. They have a Sauvignon Blanc. They have, they have a, a Prosecco. Pinot Grigio. I didn't know that. Yeah, Sweet. yeah, they do. Love they do. Prosecco. I've got about six six bottles upstairs right now. I'll be mm. chilling and and releasing the hounds tomorrow when the family <laughs> arrives. So, Fit Vine Wines. Uh, what they're doing is they're giving uh, everyone who uses the code Ben over at fitvinewine.com, a pretty massive discount on their wines. You just go to fitvinewine.com and you use code BEN. I think the discount varies from wine to wine, but either way, uh, just go to fitvinewine.com, use code BEN, and you can try this ultra-smooth, ultra-refined, very tannin-rich wine. They grow their grapes at a high altitude to concentrate the antioxidants, and it's just it's good. And, the, and they've, they've brought the sugar down to 0 0.09 grams of sugar per glass of wine. That's 90% less sugar than you get in the average wine. So it's basically got almost zero sugar in it. So it's good stuff. Nice. Uh, and then the, the last one is uh, Ad Nova. And, you know, I've, I've recently become a little bit obsessed with, with bees, with studying a lot of these superfoods that we get from bees, like wild raw honey and fresh bee pollen and bee propolis and royal jelly. Uh, all of these have an amazing effect on the immune system, and they contain probiotics and enzymes. They're one of the reasons that, that honey, if you leave it on your counter, it never goes bad uh, because it, it's just it, it takes care of itself. And, you know, the royal jelly is what the queen bee eats. That's the one that all the little baby bees don't get after a certain period of time. But, but whichever one is chosen to be the queen keeps on getting the royal jelly. And then the propolis is used uh, as a really potent antiviral and antibacterial to keep the bee colony from dying. But what this, these folks at Adnova have done is they've taken the wild raw honey and the fresh bee pollen and the propolis and the royal jelly, and then they've blended that with like marine phytoplankton and schizandra berries and organic cinnamon and organic moringa and ginger and turmeric and even shilajit, uh, which is a really, really amazing antioxidant and mineral rich compound. And they've blended all this together in like this superfood. It's almost like a superfood that's the texture of raw honey. 
is really, really good. I haven't really seen anything like this on the market before. Uh, but what they're doing is they're going to give a 10% discount on the, on the Odd Nova. So it's made by a company called Gosha's Organics. You go to goshasorganics.com. It's G-O-S-H-A-S Organics, goshasorganics.com. And you use code BEN10 percentage sign, like BEN10 percentage sign. And that knocks 10% off and it comes to your house in this little black Miron jar. Super, super powerful stuff. So check that out. And then uh, finally, just a few little announcements. Uh, I will be down in Las Vegas at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. So any of you interested in the whole anti-aging and longevity piece, I'll be speaking on male sexual performance there. That's December 14th through the 16th in Vegas. I feel like going to gamble before Christmas. and uh, Don't worry, you'll get lots of gift cards for Christmas and you can replenish your lost funds but, <laughs> but go to vegas december 14th through the 16th also be speaking down in new orleans louisiana at the serious business conference in new orleans louisiana uh and that's january 20th through the 21st and there's a few other adventures that you can join me on i'll put a link to all of them if you just go to ben greenfield slash 392 that's ben greenfield slash 392 if you want to get in on all the goodness listener q a Hey Ben and Brock, it's Graham from Melbourne in Australia here. Just got a quick question. I'm about to go into hospital for an operation on an ingual and an umbilical hernia. And I wonder what your thoughts are on training post-op. Um, I was thinking complex and perhaps some indoor cycling, cycling, but really interested in your thoughts on exercises basically that don't engage the core. Thanks guys, appreciate your help. It's good to hear from Graham again. It He's is. been on the podcast Graham's a couple our, of times, hasn't he? He has. He's our friend. We used to go down to Thailand and race in the triathlon down in Thailand and, and mm-hmm. a few other races like world championships, the triathlon, back when Brock and I were just doing the triathlon circuit all over the world. And Graham was one of our homies. He'd come and hang with us and usually bring some of his Australian compatriots and we'd have a good time and, and learn all sorts of dirty Australian phrases from Graham. Like I, <laughs> I think one of the ones I liked the most was we got this lovely noodle dish in Thailand with the, with the, uh, the fried prawns and like the little crispy rice noodles. And he called that one prawns yeah. and pubes. Yeah. Remember prawns and pubes mm. at the black cat restaurant? <laughs> you remember it? Laguna Phuket, it was delicious, Thailand. But it yeah, was pretty good until upsetting. he referred to us prawns and pubes. So, um, I want to tackle the elephant in the room here first. Uh, okay. And, and it's not a prawn. Where's the elephant? Um, the it's exercise is his, is his antidepressant. Exercise is his antidepressant. Now, I am reading a book right now. And, you know, admittedly, I am, I am kind of going through this myself because last week coming back from New York City, I kind of tripped and stumbled going down the stairs carrying all of my kids' bags out of the Delta Lounge. And I really mashed up my knee, like really bad. Like it, it, it hurts pretty bad. Like I did some significant damage. It's probably going to be a while before I'm doing much running or, or squatting. And of course, for me, you know, I'm supposed to still be, be doing another Spartan race in San Francisco. And I want to do this mass gain program that you and I talked about in the previous episode, Brock. And I just basically don't have a left knee right now. And walking hurts. So I've, I've had to kind of tackle this mentally, of course. We know anyone who's, who's athletic or who is fit and who experiences an injury, it's almost as though you've had a little bit of enjoyment sucked out of life. Now, I've said this before in a podcast, but one concerning factor is that if exercise or sports or fitness are your single outlet for pleasurable chemicals such as dopamine, then your life is not as well-rounded as it should be. And what I tell people is go back and think about what it is that you liked to do when you were a little boy or a little girl. Like for me, I loved to watercolor paint. I liked to play the violin. I loved chess. I absolutely loved writing and reading, uh, particularly fiction. And I loved to be outdoors, running and pulling and climbing and hoisting and carrying. And so when one portion of what I really like to do ever since I was a little boy that brings me pleasure disappears from my life, I've found that I can find a lot of fulfillment by filling that gap, 
filling that void with the other things that used to give me pleasure. I have my all my watercolor paintings up in the drawer by the table now, and I've been taking them out and doing little pencil sketches and filling it in with watercolor. Uh, I've been uh, playing music, uh, not the violin, but the guitar and the ukulele. I'm spending you know like an extra half hour per day just dinking around on my music during the time that I'd normally be working out. Uh, I have been writing more. I'm, I'm now uh, almost done with book one of Harry Potter after committing to my kids that I would read all seven. Uh, by next year, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm delving back into <laughs> fiction, both reading and writing, and I found that I'm just as fulfilled doing those type of things. Yeah, I'm a little restless, a little jumpy, a little, little, you know, don't feel quite as exhausted at the end of the day because I haven't buffeted my body quite as much as I've, I've grown accustomed to. But that's one thing is that I think that you need to have other outlets in life. And then the other thing, and I, I promise, Graham, I will give some practical advice here here as well. Uh, is that there's a book I'm reading called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. And this is written by John Ortberg, one of my favorite authors of all time. I read every single book that he puts out. And he talks about how we get inundated with messages that try to get us to obsess over the, the outer you, right, over our, our physical appearance. You know, experts tell us that if we exercise regularly, we're going to add two years to our life. But the you know bad news is we'll spend those two years exercising, uh, you know. And and Winston <laughs> Churchill lived into his nineties, and he said the only exercise he ever got was serving as a pallbearer for his friends who died while they were exercising. Uh, and and he kind of he kind of gets into this this idea of being grateful for the outer you and coming to peace with your body and rejoicing in its strength and accepting it in its limitations and being grateful for it. And uh, but remembering it it is wasting away. Right, like we are all going to be ninety, a hundred years old, you know, wrinkled and and probably a little bit frail, no matter how many stem cells that we do. And you know, he he even he couches it in terms of not just exercise, but just overworking. You know, he says the executive who works from seven a.m. to seven p.m. every day will be both very successful and fondly remembered by his wife's next husband. Uh, <laughs> and you know, it's a, this idea that, that if you work and work and work to make money and you exercise and exercise and exercise to look good, you get to the end of the day and you've really only spent a lot of time on things that are temporary because the day is coming when your, your 401k and your bank statements will be irrelevant and the titles on your resume, they're not going to impress anyone anymore. And, you know, no one will know what, what clothes hung in your closets or what car sat in your garage or how low your body fat percentage was or what you could bench press pretty much all that's left at the end of the day. John Ortberg says in his book is love and every single human being that you see is someone that you can go out of your way to love and if you can't do anything else you can't work out you can't even do the kind of things you like to do when you're a little boy if you simply love people you really are focusing on what is eternal not transparent and that's people's souls people's spirits and so I think it's it's good to always remember that even when you can't exercise, even when you can't be fit, that's temporary. The outside's temporary. What's inside is what's eternal and more meaningful. And that's that really helps me when when I start to obsess over, oh, I can't exercise and my arms are going to shrink and I'm not going to be able to squat what I used to be able to squat and I can't run eight miles anymore. But a lot of that doesn't matter. That's just me. That's just me and my ego, right? And, and what other people expect of me or how I want to impress the world. But it's not, in the whole scheme of things, very important. And, of course, this might sound like it flies in the face of what I do when it comes to, like, my obsession or my seeming obsession with longevity and anti-aging. But even that, I couch with this idea that the reason that you would engage in all these efforts to live a long time and to be fit and to defy aging is so that you can simply be around for a longer period of time to achieve your purpose in life. Not so that you can beat everybody, not so you can have the most sex, not so you can buy the most cars or make the most money or have the biggest bank account. It's simply so that you can be best equipped with the body that you've been given and the unique skill set you've been given to help people out. So I don't think that that we take this idea of the inner you being the only thing that's important as an excuse to neglect the outer you. You must care for the outer you so that the inner you can change as many people as possible. But part of caring for the outer you may not necessarily mean, you know, maintaining your six pack abs as much as, you know, just making sure that you keep yourself able to be be functional. So, uh, so I'm gonna well let me said. get off my soapbox. Well oh, thank you. No, that thank was you. great. 
Very I'll, well said. I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now and get to the meat of Graham's question. Uh, Graham, you need to look at what pregnant people do. Pregnant ah, women, yeah. specifically. <laughs> because when, when you look at diastasis recti and a lot of the recommendations for core strengthening or just general strengthening overall for pregnant women, they, they're, they're isolating non-abdominal muscles and they're avoiding the strain on the on the abdominal area by uh, by doing a lot of seated exercises with resistance bands, using a lot of free weights, doing a lot of exercises in a seated position because your core is able to relax. As a matter of fact, when I do like free weight or not free weight, but uh, machine circuits at the gym, mm-hmm. I purposefully keep my butt slightly elevated above the seat, like the seated chest press or the or the lat pull down, you know, I'll get into a lunging position or on the shoulder press, I'll kind of like, like press myself up out of the seat as I press overhead so that I will engage my core, right? Because any of these seated free weight or seated machines, they do a very good job at disengaging your core, but that could also be used to your advantage. If you have an injured core, you can simply keep your butt planted and move the weights. And in addition to that, doing unilateral exercises versus bilateral exercises also allows you to prevent from engaging your abdominals quite as much. So if you're accustomed to doing a double arm overhead dumbbell press, you would do it with a single arm. Same thing with a lot of these machines. If they have independent cams or independent arms on them, you can work your legs or your arms in a unilateral sense rather than than working both at the same time. And these are all the same type of things you would hear as recommendations given to pregnant women, along with the style of cardiovascular exercise that's done, right? It's all cycling, it's all elliptical, it's all swimming. So a lot of this stuff, I realize it's 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 pretty straightforward. I know Graham is a smart guy. He's, he's an exercise coach himself. And so I think he, he gets this, but it, really it just comes down to looking at, at what a lot of, of uh, a lot of the recommendations are for pregnancy. I also have an article that I wrote uh, called How to Exercise with a Low Back Injury. And Mm, many of those exercises are the same type of exercises that you would use for a a hurt uh, or, or, you know, abdominals. You know, it's very simple. You know, it's like, you know, four to six rounds of machine chest press, lat pull down, machine shoulder press, seated rows, stability ball squats, right, where you're doing a squat, but you have your back against the ball, against the wall, and you're kind of doing Mm. your squats, moving the ball up and down against the wall, and then machine leg extensions and machine leg curls. You could do that Monday. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You can do like non weight bearing cardio on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Do a lot of sauna, do a lot of cold, do a lot of things that will allow the blood to continue to flow and still build many similar elements as fitness builds uh, without necessarily straining the body. And that can at least keep you sane as you're waiting for this thing to heal. I mean, that's exactly what I do is I'd just be doing like a machine based circuit every other day, full body doing non-impact cardio on the other days, throwing in a lot of sauna, throwing in some cold thermogenesis, cold showers, ice soaks, or a cryotherapy chamber. And you can stay you can stay pretty fit with that type of approach. And Graham brought up the Compex, like the EMS. Would you throw some of that in too? Yeah, electrical muscle stimulation is very good. Now, I, I like this unit called a new fit. Uh, just blows the Compex out of the water as far as the intensity of the contraction. I mean, it'll simulate like a 600 pound squat, uh, and, and not, uh, not create a need to use your abdominals during that time. So yeah, any of these electrical muscle stimulation devices can work and, and do work. And they've been shown to be able to maintain things like strength and power in the same way that sauna has been shown to be able to maintain muscle mass, even when you're not exercising. So yeah, that's certainly another strategy. Although that, that new fit, and I'll, I'll link to that one in the show notes as well. If you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 392, that's a really good one. As a matter of fact, mine is out in my living room right now. I dug it out of the garage last night when I realized this, this knee is just not really cooperating. And you know mm. that, that'll be my workout later on is I'll be hooking it up to my legs and just going to town and blasting my legs with this really high-intensity e-stim, but I won't have to move that knee joint at all while I'm doing it. Hey, Ben. I've recently gone keto for the purposes of fat adaptation. Uh, I'm an endurance runner, and I have noticed a lot of benefits. Um, My question is, I should be running a seven-day race in February, 300 kilometers. How should I be fueling uh, to stay optimal for this? I'm supposed to be carrying 2,200 calories with me a day. Yeah, and I'm just curious how I'm going to get that all in there. Thanks for your help. Did you happen to see the Italian woman who just broke the record for the hour cycling in the velodrome? 
No. Did you happen to see a story no. about that? She uh, she was fueled fueled with, on uh, pizza ketone. and olive oil. Oh, I was <laughs> no. going to say pizza and olive. <laughs> yeah, oil. you think? Yeah. I think that's she, her did, previous fuel. <laughs> did she use the uh, the exogenous ketones like the um, yes? The H, I think HVMN or the uh, all HVMN and and then there's another one called ketone aid. Those are the main two. Yeah, I can't remember the, which the one she esters. used, but but yeah, she she yeah. did one attempt a few months ago with the the same drink came really close to breaking the record and she did it again about a month later and broke the record and and it was kind of infuriating that everybody just focused on the ketone drink and kind of yeah. forgot that there was actually a badass woman riding the bike kind of like kind of like riding the bike kind of like lance everybody focuses on the drugs and neglects to point out the fact that everybody was doing the drugs and he was just a beast yeah so yeah uh you know the idea of using exogenous ketones is certainly something that could be a strategy here they are expensive i think that these ketone esters that this cyclist you're referring to brock used are you know they're they're far more efficacious i have some upstairs particularly when you combine them with essential amino acids you can just go for days uh, with with very high amount of energy. Uh, granted, for running a seven day race, uh, we'll want to make sure that the carbohydrate stores are not becoming exhausted as well. And mm. I'll get into that as well, uh, and also the mineral component. But ultimately, uh, ketone esters are incredibly efficacious. Ketone salts, which would be more like a beta hydroxybutyrate salt, still elevates ketones, not as rapidly. You know, when I drink ketone esters, for those of you who are familiar with ketosis and how to measure it, I will, within about 40 minutes, go from below one millimolar up to above seven millimolar of ketones. Uh, and that's not even being fast or anything like that. It just jacks up ketones to the level that they'd be at if you had fasted for several days. Granted, you're not getting a lot of the longevity benefits of fasting and the cellular autophagy benefits mm -hmm. of fasting, but but you're getting that boost in energy and almost that alternative substrate to glucose and fatty acids to be used as a fuel. So uh, that is definitely a strategy, and that's one of the strategies that I outline in this article that I wrote entitled How to Get into Ketosis. And I will link to that in the show notes. But in that article, which I wrote particularly for endurance athletes, because I spell out what you do if you're going to do an Ironman or a marathon or a long cycling event, those strategies would actually work very well in this type of scenario. So uh, meaning that if Jessica can carry 2,200 calories with her per day, the way that I would do it would be as follows. I would use ketone esters. Uh, if you cannot afford those or can't get them, then use an MCT oil or a C8, caprylic acid. You don't need to use both. That's a little bit redundant. But if budgeting is an issue, the MCT or the caprylic acid will get you to generate many of the type of ketones you're going to get from using a ketone ester or a ketone salt with a little less expense over those seven days. It can also result in a little bit greater risk of digestive distress, so you need to be careful not to get poopy pants doing your MCT. But I used to do at least a <laughs> tablespoon every hour when I'd race Ironman, and then I would combine that with the next thing that I'd recommend to you, and that would be amino acids, uh, particularly mm. essential amino acids. You know, the, the person who first turned me on to using amino acids when I was racing the 2013, you were up there with me, Brock, the Ironman Canada 2013, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think Whistler. it was. Yeah, yeah. Was so um, my friend, Dr. Peter Atia had recommended to me that I use the BioSteel branch chain amino acids. And I used those, but the the data on essential amino acids just blows branch chain amino acids out of the water when you look at the ability of the muscles to be able to recover because you're getting a full spectrum of amino acids. And if you're doing, you know, two a day or in this case, you know, seven days in a row of working out, then I think that essential amino acids would trump BCAAs. And in fact, after doing that Canada race, I switched from the BioSteel uh, BCAAs to an essential amino acid complex, very similar to what we have now at, at Keon in terms of the ratios, and noted a remarkable difference in energy levels. I think probably I had more competing for tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier with those amino acids, so less risk of central nervous system fatigue and, and bonking, so to speak, you know, in a, in a nervous system manner, not in a loss of carbohydrate manner, but a nervous system manner. And so uh, you've got ketones or MCTs, then you add amino acids into that, and then the other two components that you'll want, uh, because that means that you've you've kind of nailed your easy to digest, you know, quote fats unquote, and your easy to digest proteins in the form of amino acids. Then you would want some type of carbohydrate. 
Now, I had in the past for a very long period of time recommended uh, You Can Super Starch as a very mm, kind of like yeah. slow bleed carbohydrate, but I found that caused fermentation and gastric distress in a lot of people, including myself. So I just I'm pointing I, at I, myself as well. Yeah. Yeah. I could just no longer Farts recommend it for, you know, for, <laughs> for a one day event. You can get away with it, right? You could do a one day event and yeah, you're going to fart for a while afterwards, but it goes well. But if you got to work it the next day and the next day and the next day and you're just bloated and gassy, I don't think it's worth it. So I'm a bigger fan of a dextrin source. Dextrin, uh, potato-based dextrin tends to be burnt very, very uh, easily. Uh, and there are ah, companies that do... again, hey? Yeah, there are companies that do like these highly branched clustered dextrins that are usually isolated from a potato starch source, uh, sometimes a corn starch source, but usually potato. Uh, they're far more digestible than this maltodextrin that you tend to see. Uh, there are different forms called highly branched cluster dextrin. They tend to just be burnt super clean. Uh, they have a very low what is called osmolality, and that results in a faster gastric clearance and uh, uh, less blood getting kind of diverted into the gut. And the, the brand that I like right now for that, and you would only need to use about 100 calories of this per hour, you know, as opposed to the typical recommendations for carbohydrate, which is like, you know, 250 to, to 300 calories per hour. Be, because again, you have your amino acids and you have your ketones, so you need to eat less carbs. And, you know, this returns to your question about how to stay in ketosis. Uh, a company, uh, Gaspari Nutrition, they have one called Glycofuse. And uh, Glycofuse is a decent source for... Uh, for this dextrin, you can just get a big, big uh, uh, canister of it, and it's pretty clean. Uh, you just get the unflavored version uh, made by Gaspari Nutrition. It's G-A-S-P-A-R-I. I'll put a link in the show notes, and that's what I would do for your carbohydrate source uh, for 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 like a like a blend. You're, so you're going to drink this out of a water bottle or one of those uh, fuel belt. Pa- what, what do you call them? The um, flask. The flasks and the mm, fuel yeah. belt type of belts. So you've got your glycofuse, you've got a ketone or an MCT source, you've got an amino source. Then the last thing you would need is minerals. And, and mineral need really does go up when you're in ketosis because as you dump carbohydrates, you dump a lot of minerals. There's an increased need for potassium as you're consuming a lot of ketones. And for that, you can just simply get like a good powdered electrolyte blend to blend in with all the rest of this stuff. Uh, for that, I like Thorn. They've got a really good blend called Catalytes. Uh, that would be one that you could use. And and again, you just blend that up with a glycofuse, with your ketone or your MCT, and with your aminos, and you've got like a blend you could put into a water bottle for an Ironman triathlon. Uh, you could put into a flask for a run, and it burns clean. And, uh, you know, I've used that many times in very long workouts, and, and you get a really good clean burning fuel. And you can just mix it all up beforehand and then just just drink it as you go. You can mix that up each morning, for example. And the amount that you'd want approximately would be about, for each hour of racing, about 5 grams of amino acids, 10 if you're a very large athlete, uh, a serving of MCT or ketones, that's that's per hour, uh, glycofuse, about 100 calories of that, and then catalytes, a couple scoops of that, and that would be per hour. So you could literally just like pre-mix everything and have a flask for the first hour, for the second hour, for the third hour, et cetera. Or if you're an Ironman, you know, in your water bottle for the first hour, the second hour, the third hour. Now, the only thing I've noticed with this type of approach is that you do tend to get a craving for like something you can chew on, right? Something mm, something yeah. that that is solid, and that can also help to kind of settle the stomach to be able to chew on something. The two things I like best for that, one would be I have an article on uh, fat-based energy gels, you know, energy gels that are things like Justin's nut butter or Vitalite chia seed cells or gels or, or uh, a goo has one called a peanut butter gel. Uh, a Hammer has a peanut butter based one. Artisana has a raw almond butter one. There's a company called Yum Butter that does like superfoods blended in with the nut butter. So they'll put like hemp seeds and a little bit of coconut sugar and, and monk fruit and sunflower seeds. And so any of these type of fuels, you know, there's there's even kind of a unique gel, if you want to call it, uh, made by the company Vespa. And that's just like bee propolis and royal jelly and honey, you know, speaking of bees. And mm-hmm. that's a really good one, too. So uh, any of those would kind of fit the bill for being like a gel that you could chew on at the end of each hour. Uh, the other one that I like would be the, the Keon bar. That's one of the reasons I created the Keon bar was for people who are snowboarding, skiing, cycling, trekking, hiking, just moving for long periods of time because I created it to 
give you the closest approximation to the superfoods that I sprinkle on my smoothie each morning, but allow you to get that in a packaged format that is gut friendly during exercise. So you could do like a Keon clean energy bar, half of one of those at the end of each hour, or, you know, half of a gel packet at the end of each hour. And that just gives you something to kind of chew, you know, as, as you're going through the race. So that would be my recommendation. And the only other thing I'd throw in there is if you choose to do like a nut butter, just make sure that you've got access to water when you do that because it can really yeah. stick to the roof of your mouth. I I learned that the wrong way when I think I swallowed a, a whole packet of nut butter like halfway through a Spartan and just like couldn't open my mouth for the next mile. <laughs> hey, Ben, my name is Ken. Uh, I'm a 17-year-old, and next week I'll begin my final high school swim season. Uh, and while in off season, I've tried to put on mass and muscle. And I'm currently at 170 pounds, but my question is if you think there's any way I can continue to put on this muscle and mass while performing these long endurance uh, practices and swimming, and if so, how should I go about doing it? And what are some critical supplements you would suggest that I take to boost my perform my performance in testosterone for like building muscle? And lastly, I, I was also concerned about maybe picking up the ketogenic diet to boost my performance while I swim and to help combat with my constant drowsiness that I always feel. And I was wondering what your thoughts on this are uh, as a teenager and being an athlete of what you think the ketogenic diet, if it, is, if it is okay for me. And if it is okay, what books and info would you recommend I read before I hop into the diet? And I know that was a lot, but thank you for everything. So do you want to start with the the sort of, I guess, the biggest question in the room at the moment, which is, is a keto diet okay for a 17-year-old? Well, I mean, babies are in ketosis. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too worried about a teenager being in ketosis as long as ketosis right. is achieved without a huge amount of calorie restriction, right? All we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, is maybe having said active teenager eat less sugar and starches. And for a swimmer with as much as a high schooler swimmer does, they're kind of automatically going to be in ketosis if they're just not doing a lot of sugars and eating a lot of healthy whole foods and, and fats. And, and so I think, uh, for, from the, from the mass and the, muscle standpoint you just need to be careful first of all because you know if you're built like the average human being you know as muscle mass increases unless there's a kind of a commensurate increase in body fat you're gonna sink because muscle sinks and yeah. fat fat floats that's why you know i tell all the muscular you know, like triathletes who i coach to get with the really thick wetsuits because you just need more buoyancy so be careful i mean know that you might get the buoyancy of a brick if you if you tend to lift too much or put on too much mass you'll also develop a certain level of shoulder uh, stiffness and that can kind of uh, that, that that can be contradictory to good sh uh, swimming form, particularly for the freestyle stroke. You want some mobility and looseness in the shoulder, and so just be careful. I mean, know that your desire to build mass could kind of fly against what you want to achieve from a swimming standpoint. But if you wanted to do it, you know, I, I think that one of the better methods out there in terms of strength training for endurance athletes, particularly like mass and power would be uh, the the Juggernaut training systems in the book The Hybrid Athlete by Alex Viata. Alex Viata is this guy who's well known and kind of like the endurance sports sector as the guy who can, you know, he goes out and does an Ironman triathlon, but he also deadlifts a copious amount of weight. He can squat 700 pounds, he runs 100 miles and he he calls that you know this mix of like crossfit and ultra marathoning and powerlifting the hybrid athlete approach and it's a pretty good approach if you want to be a, a pretty good endurance athlete but also have a lot of power and strength you know his books on amazon there's another guy called chad wesley smith who has written a bunch of books uh, called the juggernaut method and, and those kind of use a, a similar type of method as alex viata recommends in his book, but it kind of allows you to build a lactic capacity and aerobic capacity and lactic capacity, power, strength, speed, all at the same time. And a book like The Hybrid Athlete actually has a, you know, has a, a concurrent powerlifting or mass gain program for a triathlete, for a marathoner, for a swimmer, for a cyclist. So he's done a pretty good job putting together a decent resource. And so and, and I like it too, because it's relatively athletic in terms of the type of lifts that you do. So for example, like a, like his hypertrophy training program to be combined for an aerobic athlete, you know, on, on the, on one day of strength training, you might be doing two sets of bench press at 90%, uh, and then another six sets at 75%, and then overhead press, you know, about six sets of that at 75%, uh, a barbell row, you know, five sets of that at 85%, dumbbell row, 
10 sets of that at 70%. And the next day you might be doing more like glute ham raises and, and deadlifts and back squats. And so it's kind of like an upper body, lower body split that one mm-hmm. with a, with a four days per week training, but pick up that book, like that. the hybrid athlete, cause it's got some, some good training protocols in it. And then from a supplementation standpoint, you know, very similar to the last episode that we did on how a skinny guy can gain muscle go back and listen to that one that was 391 i believe wasn't it brock yeah. 391 yes, it was. yeah so go listen to ben greenfieldfitness.com slash 391 the the quick summary is for mass gain my favorite approach is a a whole foods based diet based on the weston a price dietary guidelines right wide intake of fermented foods raw milk organ meats very nutrient dense almost mediterranean style fats nothing overly restrictive and ample in natural ancestral forms of carbohydrate for some of that carbohydrate refueling. Uh, a good digestive enzyme like the thorn biogest. So you're actually breaking down a lot of the proteins and making them more bioavailable along with a bitters. Like I like the Quicksilver scientific uh, bitters number nine as, as something you would use as a bitters prior to your meals. Cause you'll be eating a lot more food if you're trying to build mass and you'll want to be sure that you're able to digest that food. That's one of the issues. A lot of people who get on a mass gain diet kind of don't get, uh, and yeah. then for a stack, I like colostrum uh, as a growth hormone and IGF-1 precursor. I like amino acids, which are already explained, but like essential amino acids. Uh, and then the last two that work really well would be HMB ATP blend. Uh, and there's, there's a certain source I like for that called Millennium Sports, and I'll put a link to that uh, in the show notes. But an H- HMB ATP blend and then also uh, creatine. So, uh, and creatine just at five grams per day is perfect. So that's the type of approach that I would use, uh, from a supplementation and a training standpoint. And, um, yeah, the, the keto diet, the deal with that is, is any athlete who asks me if they should be on a, a keto diet, what I tell to them is yes, but with the exception that for about the final two to three hours of the day, you're not in ketosis because you're doing a carbohydrate refeed carbohydrate Mm, refeed. mm -hmm. And so that's the time of the day when you refuel everything, uh, you eat anywhere from 100 to 200 grams of carbohydrates from a lot of those safe sources I was talking about earlier, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, you know, yams, tubers, taro, beets, parsnip, carrots, quinoa, amaranth, millet, etc. And then you after that don't eat carbohydrates again until the next evening. But this allows you to maintain fatty acid burning during the entire day refill the carbohydrate stores at the end of the day, then kind of rinse, wash, and repeat. was wondering if heavy weightlifting could over time be bad for the heart. We know that lifting heavy weights can spike blood pressure, um, but can that be a bad thing over time? I love lifting weights. My favorite exercises, not necessarily exercises, but my favorite thing to do is lift heavy weights and build a physique. I'm just worried about the long-term effects. So um, love the show, and uh, thank you. Well, you're, you're talking to a guy who, after a decade of racing Ironman, went in for uh, ultrasound, echocardiogram, and a cardiac stress test and found that I had paraventricular contractions, when I was exercising at a high intensity, meaning electrical abnormalities, probably induced by just pushing my body for a very long period of time. And I had a slight amount of what's called athlete's heart, also known as, as uh, cardiomegaly exercise induced cardiomegaly. And that's uh, the left ventricle, right? Too much muscle, basically. Right, Right. exactly. So uh, what happens is when you train, particularly with aerobic training, this is found to be more of an issue compared to static training, such as weightlifting, your body signals your heart to pump more blood through the body to counteract the the oxygen deficit that you're building up in the skeletal muscles with long periods of aerobic exercise. So the heart enlarges as a natural physical adaptation for the body to be able to deal with the high pressures and the large amounts of blood that affect the heart during those periods of time. And over time, what happens is the chamber size of the left ventricle increases, as does the muscle mass, you know, the cardiac muscle mass and the overall wall thickness of the heart. And so with the larger left ventricle, your heart 
can uh, decrease in terms of your heart rate and still maintain a very high level of cardiac output. This is why a lot of athletes with athletes' heart have very low resting heart rates. You know, my heart rate at the time was 34 to 36 at rest, but I also had an enlarged left ventricle. Still do because it doesn't really go away. You know, and usually you get that done via an echocardiography. Um, sometimes a cardiac stress test can detect, uh, you know, some amount of what's called, uh, you know, sinus bradycardia, which is a low resting heart rate, but ultimately the echocardiogram is, is the best way to figure out if that's an issue. And, and, uh, at, at very high intensities, sometimes, uh, it can be an issue. Uh, if you're exercising at very high intensities and you have like a paraventricular contraction, th- this is one of the things that can cause sudden cardiac death during endurance exercise. Um, I, I think that it's less of an issue than a lot of people make it out to be, that it really is almost like this natural physical adaptation to exercise. But it is it, it can be an issue. It can be an issue, especially in people who... Uh, have a genetic disorder called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which would be uh, an issue that that really would cause sudden cardiac death, especially in the presence of a high amount of aerobic training. And this is something you would you would need to see a physician about to screen yourself for, like like a cardiac physician or a cardiologist. So that's for aerobic training, though. With weight training, you know, the first thing is that for a lot of time, people with high blood pressure or hypertension they were warned for a very long time to avoid strenuous lifting because it might cause this dangerous long-term rise in blood pressure. But all the studies that have been uh, that have been conducted since that point have found that ultimately weightlifting reduces resting blood pressure because as your muscles grow stronger, there's less demand on the heart. And I'll explain how that how that is in just a second. But you know, like uh, the journal Hypertension examined a, a whole bunch of adults who weightlifted and found that weight training lowered the resting systolic blood pressure. The American Heart Association found that uh, lifting two or three times a week. Uh, could lower blood pressure. And that was just like a a pretty insignificant amount of lifting, you know, like some curls and some presses. Uh, And so ultimately, there's a lot of other studies like this that show that weight training can lower blood pressure. But I want to kind of give you a better idea of how this works, because it really is fascinating. So the the function of your cardiovascular system, as most folks know, is to pump oxygen and nutrient-rich blood all throughout the tissues of your body. You know, that's where the cardio and cardiovascular comes from. It refers to your heart and your heart's contribution. It's pumping action that moves the blood through your body. And then the vascular refers to your blood vessels. That includes what's called the arterial system that carries blood from your heart to your organs and the venous systems that carries it back from the organs to the heart. And so your blood vessels can change their diameter, and this affects the resistance that your heart has to pump against or, or the actual blood pressure. So when, when you look at your heart, uh, if you increase the amount of blood that returns to the heart from the venous side of the circulation— you can increase the amount of blood pumped out of the heart. There's actually a there's there's a law in physiology, you know, and I remember this from back in my exercise physiology classes. It's called Starling's law, Starling's law of the heart. So we increase the pressure, we increase the cardiac output. So now that you have a basic understanding of this cardiovascular physiology, you could kind of figure out different ways that you could enhance cardiovascular function by increasing cardiac output. So you could strengthen the heart so that it pumps more with each beat, and that would pretty much be what cardiomegaly is, you could increase your heart rate so that you're just pumping more times per minute, uh, or you could have more blood vessels or more pliable blood vessels so your heart has to pump against less resistance, or finally, you could enhance your venous return to the heart. Now, uh, in terms of, of venous return to the heart, this is where resistance training fits in. And this is something that Doug McGuff talked about when I interviewed him. You know, your muscles pump up. They become engorged when you lift, and that's partially due to increased blood flow from increased cardiac output. And then this adrenaline causes the arteries in the gut to constrict and the arteries in the muscles to dilate. So that diverts blood flow to your working muscles. You know, it's why you shouldn't swim right after you eat because you have all this blood going to your working muscles. Mm-hmm. Well, when these arteries dilate, that causes a decrease in peripheral vascular resistance, right? The vascular resistance around the muscles, because when the artery gets bigger, the heart has less pressure to pump against, so your cardiac output goes up. Now, veins, unlike arteries, don't really have much tone. They're kind of like these passive conduits, and the way that the veins allow blood to move back towards the heart is by the milking action of the working muscles. So the more 
forcefully a muscle contracts or the heavier you lift or the more tension is in the muscle, the greater the milking action. And when that happens, as we know from that Starling's law of the heart that I mentioned earlier, you create a need for increased cardiac output. And so what this means is that as you lift and you create greater and greater amounts of peripheral resistance, that automatically allows for greater greater cardiac output and an actual lower what's called central resistance because your cardiac output has gone up. And that's probably why the blood pressure post-training decreases. And it's also why the increase in blood pressure, particularly the peripheral blood pressure that increases during the muscular contraction to stimulate the, the increased venous return actually allows for better blood flow through the heart and bigger cardiac output and lower overall blood pressure. And it turns out in study after study where they've looked into this and even investigated it with catheters, they've found that the the diastolic uh, artery pressure and the diastolic pressure actually decreases as the peripheral resistance increases. So resistance training produces these really positive cardiovascular changes, normalizes blood pressure, reduces high blood pressure, and you know I'll, I'll link to Doug McGuff's book where he goes into this in detail. But uh, ultimately, the other the other thing you should note, of course, is that long term resistance training and cardiomegaly do not have any association. So not only is resistance training and weight training good for blood pressure, but unlike aerobic training, it doesn't even cause cardiomegaly or 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 increase left ventricle size or muscle mass or thickness in the heart. So. I think it has a lot going for it, and I really like, you know, kind of Doug McGuff's idea in his book, Body by Science, that, in fact, because of all this blood flow and cardiovascular change that's occurring during weight training, it can kind of count as cardio to a certain extent, uh, especially if you use his system, which is you lift very slow, 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down, so you're maintaining a lot of peripheral resistance, and you're maintaining... Uh, a lot of blood flow into the muscle, kind of trapping muscle or trapping blood and engorged muscle and then allowing it to return back to the heart. So I would read that book. But ultimately, no, heavy weightlifting can temporarily spike your peripheral blood pressure, not your central blood pressure, but even that long term is good for your cardiovascular system. Uh, I'm not a doctor. Please don't misconstrue this as medical advice. Uh, you might have some underlying cardiac issue I don't know about. I don't want you to go lift and you know drop dead of a heart attack or have some kind of a cardiovascular incidence and, and blame me i think everybody should get some kind of a screening i think that's just prudent to get like a calcium scan score an echocardiogram and an exercise stress test at least especially if you're if you're you know an older athlete you know and i define older as really anything above age 30 uh, and uh, as long as you're doing proper screening i think i think the weight training benefits outweigh any cons well you may not be a doctor but doug mcguff is so yes that's true if you don't that's true so yeah. Go so read his book. Screw what I have to say. But but here, don't screw this. We uh, always give away some really great swag on the show, and this is the time of the show when we give away said swag. So if you go – as a matter of fact, one of the best things you can do for our show is to subscribe on iTunes and to leave a review. That really helps the show out tremendously. Subscribe anywhere. I mean, freaking you know, uh, Pandora, which we're going to be on pretty soon. You can subscribe on Stitcher. You can subscribe on Overcast, whatever, wherever you listen to podcasts. But don't just listen, subscribe, because that helps the show out a lot. So that being said, if you do leave a review in iTunes and we read your review on the show, we're going to send you a wonderful gift pack straight to your front door from my heart to yours. And you just email gear <laughs> at bengreenfieldfitness.com. That's gear at bengreenfieldfitness.com with your T-shirt size. And we'll ship that off to you. So, Brock, you want to take this one away? I do. This one comes from D Money Two Thirty Two, and I love the title. I wish Ben Greenfield was my dad. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, Ben Greenfield is the best place to go to be on the cutting edge of science. If you want great advice years ahead of its time then go to Ben Greenfield. He is the most knowledgeable host you can ask for, always baffling MDs and PhDs with the sheer amount of technical information he prepares for his smart cookie audience. Ben has seriously changed my life for the better, physically, mentally, and spiritual. spiritually. He truly cares about people and goes the extra mile for his fans. I want to be Ben Greenfield when I grow up. Gosh. He has been doing this for a long time, and his older episodes are incredible as well. Also, 
best show notes right. exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point and then and now this is the, this is the best part okay. can't forget to mention how awesome brock is Perfect yin to Ben's yang. Hmm. The Canadian sensation has the perfect witty banter and knowledgeable tips to make him the perfect co-host. Aww. Make more episodes with Brock because he, because I freaking love that guy. Wow. I freaking love you, D-Money. Thanks. I just like that I'm the yang and you're the yin. So you're the, you're the, you're, you're the effeminate, loving, caring personality and I'm the hardcore yep. fitness guy. I think that's great. Yep. He nailed it. Well, D Money, that's a great review. And you do wish I was your dad because while we are podcasting right now, my kids are actually getting a massage. I bought them a massage today because I just wanted to see how they'd feel after they get a massage. So I like to experiment They're just with gonna my be children. Like little noodles running around the house. Yeah. Their only request was that they be allowed to keep their underwear on. And I said, yes, of course. <laughs> so I wanted them yeah. to feel comfortable. I always sleep my underwear on. So, that's well, yeah, they're, they're literally out on, out on the biomat outside my office right now with Tracy, my massage therapist, working on their teeny tiny little muscles. But I did have them also get mm-hmm. up this morning and do the Swiss military routine of Superman's push-ups, squats, and uh, jumping jacks for about a half hour or so. They worked for their massage. They worked for their And, massage. of course, yeah. microdosing with psilocybin. <laughs> Not that. But go listen to last week's episode on how to raise tiny superhumans if you want to learn more about learn more about my uh, my child rearing strategies. And in the meantime, everything that we talked about today you can find over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash three ninety two. I have a turkey I need to go hunt down and shoot, so I'm gonna go gobble gobble out in the woods. <laughs> That's oh, right. Man, I can't do a turkey imitation. It was, apparently. It was close. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty good. Sounds like a mm. a flailing elephant, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's closer. Yeah. Maybe a bunch of male elephants are going to show up at your front door ready to make sweet, hot elephant love to you. So have fun with that, Brock, and uh, I'll catch you all later on the flip side. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 